plan and program uh, as we study this this morning. So Genesis chapter 15, I'll start reading in verse number 7, and I'll read down through the end of the chapter, then we'll pray and look at these verses together. Genesis chapter 15 now, and verse number 7. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took him to him, all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece, one against another, but the birds divided he not. <clears throat> and when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, in horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace." And thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And the same day the Lord made uh, made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. The Kenites and the Kenazites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. Our Father, we pray that you would help us now as we look at these verses to understand this text. I pray that you'd give us a clarity of thought, and Lord, I pray that as a result of our looking together at these precious words, we would know you better. Lord, may we exercise faith in your promises. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. It's a curious passage that we're looking at here, and uh, probably one of those passages uh, that you read through in Genesis and think, I got no idea what's going on here. Uh, it's, it's unique. It's very interesting. And with a little understanding of some culture, uh, the culture of the day uh, and traditions, we can understand what's going on here. And, uh, and so the Lord will help us as we look at this this morning. I think it's important, though, to note that all of this seems to be in response to uh, or at least underlining something that we looked at Uh, intently last Sunday, in verse number 6 of this same chapter, it says, And he, that's Abram, believed in the Lord, and he, God, counted it to him for righteousness. Abram believed God's promise. Remember the promise that God had given to him, that that he would inherit the land, that his seed would inherit the land. And Abram said, well, wait a minute, God, we got an issue here. I don't have any kids. And it doesn't look like I'm going to have any kids. And God reassured him, even though Abram came with a suggestion saying, perhaps legally we can count Eliezer and we can work it through him. God says, no, it's not going to be him. You will have a son uh, and, and that will be your heir. And so Abram decides to believe God against all hope, against uh, what, uh, what logic and reason would say. And he chooses to believe God's promise. And so God responds to that faith and counts it to him for righteousness. God moves righteousness into Abram's column, so to speak, uh, as Abram endorses the check uh, and, and claims the promise 
that God had given to him. And so now we have, uh, again, this conversation continues between Abram and God. And, and the Lord reassures him once again of this promise. You saw in verse 7 as we read earlier. He said, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. Once again, he reassures him of that promise. Yes, you're going to have a son. Yes, your seed is going to inherit this land. That's the very reason that I brought you out of Ur. This is going to happen. It's going to happen. And, uh, and of course, if God says something, you can be assured it's going to happen. Whatever he says is going to happen. Uh, there is no option of anything else happening because God is in control. He's sovereign. He's the creator. He's in charge of everything. And so when he says something, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But that doesn't mean it's easy for us to believe. <laughs> and that doesn't mean that God in his mercy doesn't allow us some, uh, some helps along the way. Uh, to trust in his promises. And it seems like that's what's going on here. God is so gracious in helping Abram uh, to, uh, to, to have uh, some confidence that God would keep his word. And so in verse number 8, we see uh, he, uh, that Abram responds to the Lord again. He says, uh, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Uh, now, in, in my Bible, the word God is in all capital letters. Is that in all capital letters? Okay, uh, that, that means that uh, the translators are translating uh, from what we would normally call Yahweh or Jehovah, perhaps. Uh, now, usually the translators translate that as Lord, and you see it often in your Bible, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, and that means Jehovah or Lord. Uh, and so in this case, the translator decide, decided to, to uh, use the word God because right before that word, often translated Lord for us, uh, is another word, Lord. It is Adonai, Adonai. And so uh, it's, it's Lord, Lord, uh, uh, Lord Jehovah, uh, Lord Yahweh. Uh, so he recognizes God as his Lord, his authority, and that's the word Adonai there, this, this authority, like a king. You are the king, uh, I submit myself to you, whatever you say goes, you just told me that I'm going to inherit this land, okay, I believe you as the king, you're in charge. Then he uses uh, his name, uh, we often use Jehovah. Uh, or Yahweh. Now here's what he asks. Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And again, at first glance, you might think that, is he kind of pushing back? Is he doubting what, what's going on? But he seems to be looking for something tangible to hang on to, uh, something to reassure him that what he just heard from God really is true and that God's really going to keep that promise. In today's world, uh, you, might, you might think of it this way. When somebody says something to you, uh, there's the advice, you better get it in writing. <laughs> okay? You better get it in writing. Uh, because otherwise they could say anything. They could, they could pretend like they didn't say it or whatever. Maybe you misheard them or whatever. You need to get it in writing. In today's legal world, you got to get things in writing. That's just how it is. And I almost wonder if that's kind of what Abram's going through here. He's like, okay, God, I, it's not that I doubt you, um, but uh, you got to give me something here, something in writing, so to speak. Give me something tangible. Almost give me a sign. Now, Abram's not the only one that, uh, that asks this kind of a question. And, and God often uh, gives signs of his promises. Uh, in fact, in, in many occasions, God tells someone, ask me a sign. And that's what happens in Isaiah uh, chapter 7, where we, we have the sign of, of the virgin birth. And, and God says, ask me for a sign. I'm going to give you the sign. The sign's going to be this virgin birth. It's an interesting passage. But, uh, but there are plenty of occasions where God gives evidence, so to speak, something written down, so to speak, to confirm his promise. The very fact that you hold in your hand a Bible, 
<laughs> is testament to this. God has given us His words written down. It's not just some feeling, some emotional experience, some dream that you had, but you can actually go to the words, go to the source, and check it out. And you can say, wait a minute, what is the Greek on this? Uh, I don't necessarily know Hebrew, but I got some resources. We can figure this out. You can go to the, to the text and you can confirm the promises of God. What a beautiful thing. Abram gets the same thing here. And within his culture, it's not necessarily a document written down, but it is uh, a, a, an exercise here that is common in the culture of what we would say is, is cutting a covenant uh, or, or signing a, 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 a covenant document of sorts uh, in, this, in this sense. And so he asks him, how am I going to know this? Where's the evidence? Can you give me something tangible? And so in verse 9, God responds. He said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years, and a, uh, a she-goat of three years uh, old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Now, God doesn't necessarily give any more instructions specifically as to what Abram is to do with these animals, but Abram was familiar with the culture and he knew what was going to happen here and what he ought to do to set this, this covenant up. Now, a covenant is a promise, uh, an agreement that you make with someone else. And oftentimes, a, a covenant has, has two deals. A promise has two deals. Okay, you, you take care of your side. I'll take care of my side. We'll work together on this. Everybody's happy. It's all good. Uh, now, I don't think God read uh, the art of the deal because what we're going to see here isn't anything like a human covenant that we would make today. You know, making sure that it's, it's fair for both and that, uh, that you're getting something, I'm getting something, and we're all happy. That's not what happens here. But God is making a clear promise and He uses this, this uh, process of, of a covenant uh, to confirm His promise to Abram. Now, there's a curious passage that, that maybe gives us some insight as to uh, what happens in this culture. Look with me at Jeremiah 34. Jeremiah 34, if you can find that. Uh, Jeremiah 34. It's a, uh, another Old Testament prophet. Uh, close to the middle of your Bible there. Jeremiah 34. And I'm going to look at verse number 18. And here we have... Uh, something similar, and God is reprimanding those that break their promise, their covenant, and He seems to hint at this uh, exercise. In verse number 18, it says, I will give the men that have transgressed my covenant, which have not performed the words of the covenant which they have made before me, when they cut the calf in twain and passed between the parts. Well, that's interesting. So there's a promise, there's a covenant that takes place, uh, and, and God makes reference to this. And, and the, the confirming of that covenant is this visible sign. They took a calf, they cut it in half, and they set the two pieces uh, apart, and it says, those that made the promise passed between the parts of it. This was a, a sign in the culture. This is, that's what they would do. And perhaps it kind of uh, had several different pictures involved here. Uh, there's, there's obviously blood involved. Uh, and, and it would seem that perhaps the, the blood of the, of the parts, this is your part, this is my part, but it's the same animal, same blood. I mean, we're, we're walking through this together and we're in this almost like this blood covenant. You know, we're in this thing together. Uh, and so the other thought is perhaps that uh, as they walked through there, it was a very serious and somber reminder that they were held responsible to their part of this promise. If you don't keep this promise, then by rights, you could be killed like this, these animals here. So this is a reminder, and as you walk through and your feet are getting bloody, as you walk between the parts, you both are, you're both 
uh, making this covenant, making this promise, I will hold up my end of the deal as you will hold up your end of the deal. Uh, and this is a picture showing that. In fact, uh, farther down in the passage, verse 19, the princes of Judah and the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs and the priests and all the people of the land which passed between the parts of the calf, I will even give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of them that seek their life and their dead bodies shall be for meat unto the fowls of the heaven and to the beasts of the earth. He says, you guys have failed in your commitment in this covenant and I'm going to give your dead bodies uh, to the birds to eat. Uh, that's the picture. That seems to be the culture. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 15. We just read in verse number 9, God told Abram to take these animals, which, by the way, would later, uh, these kinds of animals would be used uh, in the Levitical system for offerings and sacrifices. God uses these clean animals uh, in this way to uh, confirm this covenant. So he says, take these, these three animals, and then a turtle dove and a pigeon. And so Abram does. Now in verse 10, we see what he does with them. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst. In other words, he cut these animals in half. And what does he do with, with these parts? He laid each piece one against the other. Uh, and that's the idea, opposing each other. One on this side, one on that side. And then he takes the, the parts of the other animal, one on this side, one on that side, and the parts of the next one, one on this side, one on that side. And then it says, uh, the, the birds divided he not. So he evidently just kills one bird, puts it on this side, kills the other bird and puts it on that side. And so here they are, all these carcasses laying out on the ground. Verse 11, when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. God tells Abram, set this covenant up. Abram's thinking, okay, I'm going to do this. Now, who's going to walk with me through these parts? I mean, okay, God, I, I know that you're a spirit. Uh, I, how is this going to work out? And so he's kind of waiting for somebody to show up, perhaps an angel or somebody. He, I don't know, but he's waiting to walk through, as was the custom, to walk between the parts, making that promise to each other. And while he's waiting, here comes these birds. And, and they start eating the carcasses. Well, Abram's not going to have that. I mean, he drives them away and says, wait, no. Evidently, those animals must have been there a little while. And Abram must have been waiting a little while for something to happen here, uh, for God to, to work this covenant in some sense. And so they're waiting and, and Abram's driving the carcasses away, again, uh, perhaps reminding us of uh, what would happen if either Abram or God, if that's the, those are the parties of this covenant, uh, if they didn't keep their end of the deal. Uh, and so, quite a picture here. Now, I think this would be a very memorable experience for any of us. Uh, and that was the whole point of this. You're not going to forget this. Uh, and so... This is, this is part of the culture, and this is what they do. Now, what happens here? Verse number 12. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. Interesting thing happens. As Abram's waiting, a deep sleep falls on him. Uh, this word deep sleep is, is used just a, a few times in Scripture, I think five or six times. Uh, the first time we see this is where um, Adam falls asleep and God removes his rib uh, and then creates Eve. Uh, and so what this seems to indicate is that God puts a supernatural deep sleep on Abram. Uh, and in many cases... Uh, in other passages, you can see it uh, uh, later on in some other passages if you do a study on this. It seems to indicate that any time that God puts a deep sleep on somebody, it's for Him to intervene, for Him to do something, and the individual 
that's sleeping has no ability to do anything at all. Uh, and so that's the idea. Abram is totally incapacitated. He cannot do anything. God puts him to sleep, and, and then God continues in this, uh, in this cutting the covenant, so to speak. So he puts him to sleep, and as Abram is sleeping, a horror and great darkness fell upon him. Uh, Abram has great terror, and perhaps it's because of what God would say to him in just a little bit. It's hard to be dogmatic exactly what this horror, this fear um, is, but Abram is unable to do anything. He's in the deep sleep, and he has this horror feeling, uh, great fear and great darkness falls upon him, and God speaks to him. Verse 13, he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Now, maybe this is why Abram has this horrible sense of, of dread and fear and darkness. He's thinking, wait a minute, I thought God was going to give me the land that my seed was going to inherit and everything was going to be good. And God says, well, here's how it's going to happen. Here's the plan. For 400 years, your seed are going to be afflicted. They're going to be slaves. They're going to be servants in a land that is not theirs. Uh, they'll serve, and it'll be 400 years that this is going to happen. Verse 14, And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. So it's not going to stop there, Abram. After the 400 years, you're going to come out, and you're going to have a lot of substance. You're going to have a lot of possessions. Verse 15, Thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. He reassures Abram here, you won't experience this. Uh, you're going to live to be a good old age, and, and, and this is all going to happen to your seed after you. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So God tells Abram, as he's sleeping, and he's got this great darkness over him, that uh, your seed, they're going to go into this land that's not theirs. They're going to be afflicted. They're going to serve as slaves for 400 years. After that point, they're going to come out again. And when they come out, they're going to come into this promised land, and they're going to inherit this land. But you're going to have to wait a little bit for all that to happen, because the sin of the Amorites is not yet full. That phrase alone gives me such comfort. <laughs> you know, God is so gracious and merciful. God delays giving this promise to Abram, I suppose for several reasons. But one of the reasons is that God was being merciful to the Amorites. God was giving them opportunities to repent. And God was waiting, waiting for them. Uh, and, and so... He knew what was going to happen. He says, uh, 400 years from now, their iniquity is going to be full, and, and I'm going to bring you back into this land, uh, and I'll give it to you. So that's God's plan that he reiterates to uh, Abram here um, concerning this promise. All right. Now, what happens after that? Verse 17, it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And remember, what's going on with Abram at this point? He's passed out. A great deep sleep is on him. He's fully expecting, I'm going to pass through the pieces because I'm going to enter into this covenant with God in some way. But he doesn't get the opportunity to do that. God puts him to sleep and doesn't let him. And in, in essence, what happens is God says, Abram, this covenant depends on me alone. I will be the one, the only one, that passes between these animals. And so the smoking furnace and the burning fire, uh, perhaps representing two sides of this covenant, but both God alone. God the Father, we could say, and God the Son, passing through these 
these parts and saying, look, if somebody fails in this covenant, somebody's going to pay the price. (laughs) And God passes through those pieces alone, in essence saying, I will pay the price. If you fail, I'll pay the price. Wow, what a thought. This promise is unconditional as far as Abram is concerned. God says, I'm giving this to you, and you don't have to do a thing for it. In fact, if you mess up, I'll pay the penalty, and I'll make sure you get it. Wow, it's incredible. I mean, what a beautiful picture. And this is why in the New Testament, uh, we have Paul, the Apostle Paul, coming back to this and, and pointing out this is, is a promise given and it's received in faith and there is no law, there's no works, there's no effort that you can put into this. The righteousness comes in response to the faith when you believe the promise of God, which is exactly what happened in verse 6 that we, uh, we looked at last Sunday. He believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Abram cannot do anything to keep this, uh, this covenant. God makes sure it's all on him and not on Abram at all. And so at the end of this passage, uh, it says here, the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram. The word made a covenant is literally cut a covenant. Cut a covenant. In the same day, this is the day that God confirmed by cutting this covenant, ratifying this promise, this covenant that he had made with Abram. And God took all the responsibility on himself to make sure that it would happen. This is the Abrahamic covenant. Now this is to be contrast with the Mosaic covenant. And I got a couple of minutes. I want to show you the difference between this covenant and then the Mosaic covenant And we'll look at what the Apostle Paul says about it later on in Galatians. Look with me at Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. And remember, we just saw this covenant that God made with Abram. And Abram couldn't be a part of the process. He had nothing to give in this. Uh, There was nothing that he could contribute uh, to that promise. God just basically told him, I'm giving you the land and that's that. And I'm going to make sure it happens. This is yours by by way of promise. But in Exodus chapter 19, 430 years later, uh, in in fact, uh, and it seems the passage in Genesis, God uses kind of a round figure, 400 years, gives us the exact figure here, uh, more exact, 430 years, um, Later on, when the children of Israel were doing exactly what God promised, they were coming out of Egypt, and they were coming out with great substance, and this was the institution of the Passover, which is what is being celebrated this week, which is also uh, a picture, beautiful picture, of the cross of Jesus Christ. I mean, there's just so much going on here. So 430 years later, the children of Israel are coming out uh, out of Egypt, And there's another promise that's made, another covenant, another covenant. In Exodus chapter 19, we see the children of Israel, after having come out of Egypt, after having crossed through the Red Sea, now they've come to Mount Sinai and God is going to make another promise, give another promise to them. But this time it's a conditional promise. Verse number one of chapter 19, in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt. The same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai, for they were departed from Rephaim and come to the desert of Sinai and pitched in the wilderness. And uh, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say unto the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, how I bare you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant. Then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children 
of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all the words which the Lord commanded him. And the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. The Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. Uh, Once again, in this passage, we also see the thick cloud, kind of like that smoking furnace, and also a great fire at the top of the mountain. Interesting, the pictures come together. But here, this covenant is different. In essence, God says, okay, we're entering into a covenant here. Here's the deal. I will make you my people if you will do everything that I tell you to do. Fair enough, right? (laughs) Okay. And then God gives them later on in that, uh, that passage the Ten Commandments and many other commands as well. So here's the list. You've got to do all these things and I will do this for you. This is a conditional covenant, a conditional promise. This promise, uh, so now you have the children of Israel under two covenants. The first covenant, unconditional, with Abram. God says, I'm going to give you this land It's all on me. The second covenant that they are now under with God, the Mosaic covenant. God says, you obey me and you do all these things and I'll make you my people. Well, this second covenant became such a focus for the children of Israel because of all its ritual that the Abrahamic covenant kind of lost its glow to some degree. I mean, they didn't really think about it anymore. And so they were focusing on the Mosaic covenant thinking, okay, we got to get all these things, all these promises, and the only way to get them is if we work really hard and we obey everything God says. This is why in the New Testament now, you have this distinction drawn between the two. So let's now look at Galatians 3, and we'll finish right here in Galatians chapter 3. All right, Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, who is a Jew, Though he's writing to Gentiles, he's also addressing this Jewish context. And so in Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul uses the illustration of these two covenants. One, the covenant of Moses, the law, conditional promise. The other, covenant of Abram, a promise of faith. Received by faith, there's no works involved at all. And so Abram or uh, Paul draws the distinction here in Galatians chapter 3. Look with me at verse uh, 13. Well, I should back up farther. <laughs> uh, let's go back to 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. The law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Okay, this is the Mosaic Covenant. Do it and you'll live. Do it and you'll have the promises. It's a conditional promise. And so you've got to do this and then you'll get that. Now, it is evident, it is obvious to us that no matter how hard we work, we're not good enough. And you try to obey the Ten Commandments and I guarantee you've broken them. You've failed Sorry, you cannot become righteous through the Mosaic Covenant, the law. It's not going to happen. It's impossible. This is why verse 13 is so important. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Jesus deals with the Mosaic Covenant by living a righteous life to perfection. And then He becomes the curse. He takes the death penalty that you deserve and that I deserve, thereby freeing us from the Mosaic Covenant, freeing us from the law, satisfying the requirements of the law. The Mosaic Law was if you do this, if you break these commands, you die. 
Jesus died in our place. And so now He offers to us a, a swap. He'll take our place. He'll give us His righteousness. He frees us from the Mosaic Covenant. Mosaic Covenant is now no longer uh, held over the believer. It's been satisfied completely to perfection by Jesus Christ. And now we are freed from the law, Mosaic Covenant. But there is still another, another covenant. Oh, thank God for the Abrahamic covenant that is unconditional. No works required. What a beautiful thing. Verse number 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth to it. Now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto thy seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of the promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Isn't that wonderful? The Abrahamic covenant is still good. It's still good. And it depends on God alone. You and I have failed. We've messed up. But God ensures for us the promise of the inheritance by sending Jesus Christ who died in our place on the cross, freeing us from the Mosaic Covenant, satisfying even the Abrahamic Covenant. And now today we can be free. It's a beautiful thing. The Abrahamic Covenant is by promise, not by the law. Well, our time is gone. Let's bow our heads together and we'll pray. Thank you, God, for making this incredible promise to Abram and giving us now the, the opportunity to receive an inheritance by faith because of your promise. Not because we have to work or do anything, but we know that we can't keep any end of the deal. But you have made it totally dependent on yourself. And so in faith, our desire is to receive it and accept this precious promise, this incredible inheritance that you offer to us. Lord, I pray that you would Make this real to us and help us understand your grace, your love, your goodness, and your compassion. And may we come to you under the Abrahamic covenant. May we come to you in faith, believing, trusting you for what you promise you will do for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.